All right, well, last week we got into the whole nitty-gritty of the, the marriage uh, relationship and the physical aspect of it and the purpose of it to avoid fornication and so forth. So we won't have to deal with such an uncomfortable subject. I don't, I don't know why it's uncomfortable. It's just reality. Yeah. Um, it is in the Bible, but it's uncomfortable for people, I suppose, because nobody uses the Bible to, to teach the, the actual Bible and how it gets right in your life, man. But God is involved in your life, in your house, in everything you do on a daily basis, even down to such basic things as marriage. Amen. And so we covered all that stuff last week. We finished somewhere around, I don't know, verse 6. But I speak this by permission and not a commandment, where Paul is basically saying, Look, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Um, but you don't have to get married is what he's saying. Uh, this is permitted. But you don't have to, because I would that you would even be as I am, which is unmarried. Um, see how he says that? But this, but I speak this by permission, not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself. So he's basically saying you don't have to get married if you don't want to. I would like you to be like I am. And then later on in the chapter, he explains why, because there's this present distress. He's talking about the present distress that they're under, persecution. You know, it's not a good idea if you're actually following the Bible. Say you're a single guy and you're, you're following the Bible and you're out there and you're preaching the gospel. And you could actually be beheaded or put on a cross or whatever else, burnt at the stake. Probably not a good idea to get married if you're going to be dead in, in three years and you're going to have a, 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 a widow with a baby and you're gone. So he's basically saying, look, man, it's better that you were as I am. Now, at the same time, Remember, he, he wrote, he writes later to Timothy that a bishop must be the husband of one wife. So he's, so the Catholic Church will use uh, texts like this to say, see, it's better for you to be celibate. Um, yeah, in that present distress, it's better for, for you to be celibate. And, and there's some sense to that, too. You can go out and street preach all you want if you're unmarried. You don't have to worry. I mean, you could eat a couple bugs and sleep on some dirt under any a tree. And who cares? But when you got mama and babies... Well, I've got to go make some money. Amen. i got to go do what i got to do or plant some crops. i got to do something to take care of the family I have. So a, a lot of my time is going to be used up taking care of my family. I'm not going to be able to go out street preaching whenever I want. And this is what Paul's trying to say. But if you're to be a bishop of a church, you must be the husband of one wife, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3. So this isn't a, uh, this isn't a demand by Paul that anybody that can serve God has to be unmarried. Because obviously other men that serve God must be married. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't a text to show why the priesthood should be celibate. Because basically there isn't a priesthood anyway. It's not a physical priesthood, um, but a spiritual one. And that's everybody. Amen. Not clergy slash laity. There's no right. such thing in the Bible. Amen. Um, there are overseers and offices in the church, but... We're all members of the same body, amen? And that one member is any more important than the other member. We're going to get into that in chapter 12. Um, and Paul's going to reveal this to these Corinthians and to those that read this epistle, which is us. So Paul says, But I speak this by permission and not a commandment, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. In other words, some can handle it, some can't handle it. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide, even as I. If you can do it, great. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. But see, it's, you're better off marrying than to suffer under the um, hunger of your body. You know what I'm saying, like we were talking last week. So you're better off getting married if you're going to be under a struggle. Uh, because then you're going to be so preoccupied with your hunger, you know, like a starving man in the desert, all you can think about is, I've got to get food, i got to get food, i got to get food. How can you do anything? You can't do anything else. You ain't thinking about, boy, I wonder when I can, the next time I can play baseball is. You're starving. You're in the middle of the desert. You can care less about anything but feeding your hunger. So this is the point. If you've are at that, if you got that problem, then get married. That's what it's for. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry uh, than to burn. So now we're going to get into this whole idea where Paul starts discussing marriage, divorce, and remarriage, okay? And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. 
So before I get into reading this through, and we're gonna we're gonna take each verse here and we're gonna explain this stuff. I'm going to describe a typical false teaching within the Baptist circles concerning this issue, and then we'll go and look at this verse by verse, which will dismantle that false teaching. Okay? Because people use use the Bible to hurt divorced people in the body of Christ. There's been a lot of damage done to divorced and remarried people in the body of Christ as if they've committed the unpardonable sin. As if they are of no use to God in ministry. They're just saved. They just can come and give money, of course. But you can't serve in any ministerial capacity or the head of any ministerial um, uh, exercise of your church. And people are hurt by this. I know people that have counseled young people that do burn that they cannot marry because they've been divorced. People will take the Bible and try to, try to teach that a divorced young person in their 20s and 30s can never remarry again. You're just, I don't know, it's too bad, buddy. You're just trapped. You're just going to have to suffer. Even though the Bible says it is better to marry than to burn. And I love verse number Two, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Um, guess what? Every man includes divorced people, too. Every is every. It doesn't say every except for divorced people. Um, so the typical, the typical teaching, now look, I'm not going to be able to cover every single false teaching concerning this. I can only teach this in a general sense. But it's not like we haven't had this conversation with all kinds of people with all different kinds of positions because we have and we have answers for every single one of them because we know the Bible okay so if you go to Romans chapter 7 this is a typical place that uh, you'll be dragged to regarding this issue it's typically taught that divorce is never acceptable under any circumstances this is one place that they'll run to we're going to look at what Jesus said in Matthew 19 as well. But Romans chapter 7 says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So they'll, they'll take you to this passage here, verses 1, 2, and 3, basically say exactly what they teach. The only way that you could ever remarry is if your spouse is dead. Isn't that what it says? If, if, right. if your husband is still alive, uh, and you go marry another, you're in adultery. It doesn't even mention divorce. The problem is, Paul isn't talking about marriage. He's talking about the relationship of the Christian with the law and with Christ. They're going to take you right to Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. They're going to rip it completely out of the context and make it be the end-all, be-all about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. It's not talking about marriage. He's not talking about marriage. He's talking about the law and the power it has over the Christian. Right. And he's using the general rule of marriage to emphasize his point. But he doesn't get into all the exceptions and all the nitty gritty and all those, the, the small print, if you will, concerning marriage. Because he's not talking about marriage. Right. As a matter of fact, if you remember in our travels through the book of Acts, he wrote 1 Corinthians 7 before he wrote this. So was he doing nullifying everything he wrote to the Corinthians? Corinthians chapter 7 is already in print before he ever writes Romans chapter 7. He's not talking about marriage in Romans chapter 7. He's just using the general rule of marriage as an example of Christ's relation, I mean the Christian's relationship with the law. He's no longer married to the law. He's married to another, right. Christ. Amen. He's dead to the law. Right. And so therefore, because of death, he's now free to marry another, which is Christ. Right. This is all he's talking about. He's not talking about everything there is to know about marriage. Amen. So when preachers do that, they do the same thing we've been preaching against for a They proof text. Right. You can't do that. Look at Matthew chapter 19. 
six, seven, eight bumping off the wall. Five, six. <laughs> See what context will do? It'll clear it up. But we're too lazy to use context because all we want to do is read three <laughs> verses instead of reading the whole epistle and find out what in the world Paul's talking about. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is talking to his disciples and so forth and the Pharisees. Verse number 7. Uh, we'll, we'll back up a little bit. Uh, verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Okay, so your typical preacher will say, See, God never intended for divorce. Taking the Malachi chapter 2 will show you that God hates putting away and so forth. Um, God never intended. That was Moses. Only Moses did that for the hardness of your heart. But see, it was never intended to be that way. But then again, they're not paying attention to what they're reading. I can read. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. And he's talking about because in the beginning it was not so. See? In the beginning, it was not so. From the beginning, it was not so that there should be a divorce. Well, guess what? What was the conditions in the beginning? Perfection. There was no sin in the beginning. God never intended for there to be sin either. Is there sin? Oh, wow, wow, what a novel concept. That's interesting. Huh. Something happened and changed stuff. So, so see, to, to point to what Jesus is saying and saying, see, God's never for divorce. Um, God hates divorce. Look, we're not teaching this in a sense that um, we are condoning divorce. And we're not bashing the false teachers for wanting to um, uh, stress the lifelong commitment you're making when you're getting married. I understand that. Their, the, the, their motives are well. Their motives are good. But you can't ignore the exceptions that are in the Bible because there's there's damage done from sin. There are victims um, because of sin. And so God is a graceful God, is He not? He's more graceful than these preachers. Okay, God is more graceful than pastors and preachers. Okay? Um, and we're going to point some of those things out where God is graceful. Look at uh, look at Jeremiah chapter three. Okay, we're there. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter three. Of course, God hates putting away because that's not the ideal. That's not what God had intended to begin with, and that's why He hates sin too. But it is. It is what it is. Jesus and Paul are dealing with reality. Not the ideal Garden of Eden. That's why you needed a Savior to begin with. So all that will be restored later on when Jesus comes back after that. But in the meantime, we live in a sin-cursed world. So guess what? God has allowed a bill of divorcement under certain conditions. Look at Jeremiah chapter 3. Look at verse... Uh, Verse 6, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said, After she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. God himself is divorced. 
So I guess God's not welcome in the pulpits of these preachers. Right. Now, of course, that's absurd because they'll, they'll, they'll preach things that are true in other areas and God's in the pulpit, but they have no idea what they're talking about. Why in the world would God use language like this if it's such an abominable thing? Um, could you imagine God using, uh, painting himself a sodomite in an illustration to prove a point? Do you think God would use that abominable thing to describe himself in any situation whatsoever? Do you think so? No. So then why is he describing himself as divorce? Because people will put divorce as worse than sodomy. And you want to know how I know that? Because a sodomite can get saved and become a pastor, but they won't let a divorced man get saved and be a pastor. They think sodomite's cleaner than a divorced man. These people are nuts. They have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. I have no problem saying that. Amen. They're wrong. W R O N G wrong. They're wrong and that and that teaching is false. Demonstrably false. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 24. Uh, let, me, let me stop. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse number 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop... He desires, desires the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, and so forth. So they'll say, well, if a man's been divorced, God doesn't recognize divorce, because from the beginning it was not so. This is their premise. So divorce is illegitimate. It's not something God ever intended and doesn't recognize. So therefore, if a man is divorced and remarried, he's got two living wives. Therefore, he can't be a pastor. He's got two wives. That's how they teach it. He's not qualified because he's got two wives. Well, now go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Look, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse number 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him get, write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. Huh, wow, that's interesting. Huh. That goes contrary to what the preacher said. Huh, well, the preacher can't be wrong because he's the man of God. <laughs> and if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and send, sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, yada, yada, yada. There's such a thing as a former spouse. Yeah. They are no longer your spouse. Amen. They are not married to you anymore. Right. So if a person has been divorced, they are not married. If they remarry, they only have one spouse. Right. And they are qualified for the ministry. You can go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and I'll prove it to you even some more. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be, not must have always been, must be, present tense verb, must be what? Blameless. Does that mean he couldn't have been blamed for something when he was 12? Uh -oh. Must be the husband of one wife right now. Not that he had a different one 10 years ago. How many wives has he got today? Right. Must be vigilant. Must be sober. You mean he couldn't have been a drunk when he was 18? No, is he sober now? must be of good behavior his whole life or now given to hospitality apt to teach not given to wine no striker not greedy and filthy looter but patient not a brawler not covetous see if if you were to put this list to an entire man's life 
Nobody's qualified. It's talking about right now. Is the man qualified right now? Has God done such a great work in his life right now that he is qualified to be a pastor? That's what it's talking about. Well, how come this one happens? They can, how come they take this one qualification out of this entire list of things and then they look backwards at all that stuff? And they apply the man's whole life before now. How come they don't do that with the whole list? Because they're hypocrites and they're teaching something false and they're going to hold to their false teaching no matter whether you show it to them right in their grill or not. It doesn't matter. They're going to hold to their thing. Because the denomination said so. So we're going to follow the denomination and not the Bible. It's pretty clear. Nobody would be qualified if you did that to everything. Plus, you know, it's pretty easy to, to know when a, when a man or a woman has been divorced. That's something that person cannot hide. Right. Usually. They cannot hide that. But a man ain't going to tell you that he used to be a drunk when he was 17 years old. Or he used to fight every week in the street. He can pretend like he's always been perfect because I'm the pastor. You know, see, they can hide their sins. But that divorced man can't. So they can one-up them. They can one-up them. But look, it don't work. Because <laughs> I got a Bible. Let me explain to you a little bit further. Let's take, let's take an example. Let's just say they're right. Let's just say they're right. You got a man that has done everything right his whole life. And he marries a woman. And he gets divorced. And this is the only woman he's ever known physically. This is the only woman he's ever known. He did it all right. He got married, didn't know her before they got married. Did everything right. He was a virgin, got married. Knows his wife, gets divorced. He can never pastor. According to these brethren. That guy can never pastor. Now let's see who can pastor. Okay, you got a young guy who goes off to Bible college. He wants to be a pastor. He goes to Bible college. They got some cute girls over there in the choir. So he fornicates with ten of them, doesn't have the decency to marry a one of them. Finally marries one of them, number 11, 12, 20. <coughs> he can be a pastor. He's only been married once. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, no. This guy didn't even have any decency. He's fornicating. Fornicating his whole life. Saved already and everything. But he, he's the pastor, right? He could be, he's holier than that guy that got divorced, right? He's more right with God, has been more right with God all this time, because he ain't never committed that unpardonable sin. That's ridiculous. Amen. How about another guy? The guy's a sodomite. Fornicates with 50 other sodomites. Oh, he converts, gets saved, you know, marries a woman. Oh, he can be your pastor. Do you see how absurd this is? This is ridiculous. This is absolutely absurd. Right. Amen. Does it, I mean, does this make any sense to anybody? Do you see the absurdity? Right. Amen. Amen. There are people in the pulpits now that fit that description. Yes. That's right. And there are people that have been divorced and had maybe known that one person. That's it. It's all they knew their whole life. But they did everything the right way. They waited till they got married. They did everything right but they're banned from ever being anything for God because they've been divorced. That's absurd. Amen. Okay, and then I'll finish it with this. They run to Romans chapter 7. You know, a, a man or woman is bound to their spouse as long as they, that person's alive. Let me put it to you like this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, except it be for fornication, sexual sin. Technically, let's say a person is married. They don't recognize those. The, the false teachers don't recognize the exception of adultery. Doesn't matter. Right. Divorce is not allowable or recognized by God under any circumstances. So, uh, a person can be married and their spouse can be unfaithful to them. And then they end up getting divorced because that person just leaves. They're gone. They just take off. Divorce the, the, the Christian, whatever. And now that person can never remarry has to stay single their whole life. They didn't do anything wrong. They're doing everything right, trying to live by, by the Bible. They're trying to serve God. The person takes off, their spouse takes off, divorces them or her, 
and he can't remarry. He not only can't remarry, he can't be involved in ministry or anything else. Well, guess what? If they were to follow the law, guess what would have happened to that spouse? Right. They would have been stoned to death. They would be dead. They would be dead at the bottom of a pile of rocks. Oh, so in that case, that guy could get married then. So basically what your false teacher is teaching is, kill them! Kill them! Kill that adulterer! Put them at the bottom of a pile of rocks! Mm -hmm. That's what we teach. We're be that person's better off dead than getting saved. Mm. God is gracious enough to offer that person mm. salvation and life to get to be able to lot to live. Mm -hmm. So the innocent party is able to get a bill of divorce and move on and get married and serve God and live for God and raise children to the glory of God. Amen. These guys are saying to be better off dead. Okay, so what do you want the guy to do? Go out and have somebody offer or off him? Is that what you'd rather he did? Hmm. That's what they're teaching. You're better off that person were dead. Fine. I'll pay somebody to offer. I could be pastor. Hey, I, you know, I can hire a hitman. I can pastor church. So I hire a hitman. Nobody knows about it. Just me and God. But see, God wanted them dead anyway, right? See, because I'll just go back to the same Old Testament. justify that stuff. Get out of here, man. God is graceful. Let's that wrong Amen. live. Amen. He wants them to find Christ just as much as he wanted you to find Christ. Amen. 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 Does this make any sense? Yes, All right, now let's see what the Bible teaches. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The absurdity of that position is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And it's taught usually by a bunch of hypocrites. No, not always. Some of them are well-meaning, and they, they fit all the qualifications. Don't have any skeletons in their closet or anything. Amen? Well, that guy's rare. That guy's rare. You see, this is why God gave a bill of divorce in the first place. Under the law, if a person was found committing adultery, they were to be stoned to death. So guess what? A man finds himself another honey. Hey, I want to go after this thing over here. Ah, I can't. I'm married to this ball and chain. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got an idea. I got an idea. Hey, Brother Jim, Brother Larry. Just, hey, I'll, I'll help you, because I know you guys aren't happy. I'll help you guys. Help me out here. I need you guys to come before the council here and tell them my wife committed adultery. So I got my two witnesses. They'll kill her, and then I can have my honey. You don't think that was going on? You don't, yeah, you don't think that was going on? You don't think innocent people were being murdered in the name of the law because two liars got up, false witnesses got up? and testify right. wrongly so that guy can go do what he wanted to do? Yeah. Now what do you think's better? Go through that whole rigmarole or I could write a bill of divorce and be done with it? Right. Yeah. We found this woman a very active adult. Because of the hardness of your heart, Moses gave a bill of divorce. Because right. mm. you guys were, were often people. Brother Bo, you had your hand up there. Yeah. In the law also, both parties were people. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Hey, they throw that other dude under the bus with her. Right. Well, I'm just bringing up the point. Just make up a guy. The adulterous woman that was brought before Jesus. That's right. In the New Testament there. John 8. It was just the woman, though. Correct. Uh, Evidently, the other dude right. was some important. He might have been a Pharisee or whatever. Yeah, right. And, I, I and, don't know that, but I'm just And saying. in John chapter 8, they, they were caught in the very act. Right. right. So right. they did know who the man was. Exactly. But you right. could have two witnesses say, well, we, it was kind of shadowy. You didn't see the dude, but, you know, it was her. Yeah, yeah we were there, but we didn't you know, pick him up. You know, so. <laughs> but you can see how man's heart could manipulate the law to kill people. Yeah. So God was sick and tired of this thing going on and just said, look, here's a, just write a bill of divorce, man. Get it over with. Because they were abusing the law to kill people bunch of false witnesses and things like that. And so this that's why they were asking Jesus, man, can we just get divorced for any old reason? And Jesus says no, except to be for fornication. Okay? Matthew chapter 19.
Now, First Corinthians chapter seven. Obviously, I have seen people hurt by this teaching. I won't name names, but there's some in this church that have expressed and have shed tears over this stuff because for the, in the, their their past they have had to um, be denied serving God. You know, the, the preacher was uh, certainly happy to take their money, yeah. but wasn't willing to allow them to be the head of anything or to teach anything, even to teach children Sunday school or anything. And they're living right. They love God. They got this horrible thing called divorce in their life. Give me a break. If God can forgive a murderer, he can't forgive a divorced person. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. And then you don't even need to forgive them because in this chapter, God has not sinned. If it's done properly. If you're divorcing under the rules, you haven't sinned anyway. You don't even have anything to be forgiven of. But man, they'll beat you down from the pulpit as if you've done something wrong. Why do you think he uses the word in this chapter bondage? Because it's men who want to use it for bondage. Keep you enslaved to their teaching. And their power and their control. So Paul says there in verse number 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and the widows, it is good for them to, if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And under the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. So now he's talking to saved people here, because that's the church of Corinth, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, and under the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Now look, this is important, verse number 11. But and if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Now, this isn't her deserting. Because it says, let her remain unmarried. There's been a divorce here. They're not married anymore. This depart, word depart, is implying a divorce. I believe that the best way to describe it would be departing from the covenant. She moved down the block. She departs from the covenant. I mean, you can still see her every day. It doesn't mean she moved to Vegas. If she departs, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. See, if you're married, see, I mean, if you're saved, there should be reconciliation if there's been divorce. So it says. But, to the rest speak I, not the Lord. Now I have to I have to make a comment on this part here. He's getting ready to talk to people that are married, a believer and an unbeliever, okay? A, a believer married to an unbeliever. So obviously prior to this he's talking to believers. Believers need to reconcile. If you've been married and you're both believers, you need to reconcile. But here he says, but in or, uh, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. Now I know people that say, Well, see, this is just Paul's opinion. Because it's not the Lord saying this, it's me. I made this up. That's what Paul's saying. The problem with that is that's not what Paul's saying. What Paul is saying is, look, I'm going to speak here. Obviously, I'm an inspiration of the Holy Ghost is in Scripture, but he says at the very last verse of the chapter. Look at the very last verse of the chapter. But I, also, but I think also that I have the Spirit of God after having said all that. So he's telling you, I'm saying this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But his point here is, is that Jesus didn't touch on what I'm about to tell you. Right. Jesus already talked on divorce in Matthew 19, Matthew 5, I think he's in Mark 2, and he's in Luke. Then Paul says, well here now, now I'm going to throw my two cents in. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't carry the weight of Scripture. It doesn't mean that this isn't from God. Does that make any sense to you? This, that's what he's saying. You know, here, here's, here's what God has told me to throw my two cents in here to kind of add on to what Jesus mentioned over there in Matthew 19 when he was speaking to a bunch of Jews. Now he's talking to born-again people 
in the body of Christ, which didn't, which didn't exist in Matthew chapter 19. And half these people are Gentiles, if not more than half. They don't have a clue what all that stuff Jesus was talking about anyway. Moses, who's Moses? So he's, he's putting an addendum in here. This isn't in contradiction to what Jesus said. This is in addition to what Jesus said. And it's primarily because in the Old Testament to the Jew, he wasn't to marry strangers. He wasn't to give his daughter to strangers and he wasn't to allow his sons to take strangers unto them. There had to be a specific division there. Now this is concerning people that are already married, then get saved. One of them gets saved. Because in this chapter, I think it's verse number 27. No, it's verse... Uh, where it says, only in the Lord. 39. If you're not married and you're saved, you're not supposed to marry somebody who's not saved. God says, you've got one pond you're allowed to fish in, and it's the saved pond. So if you ain't married and you're saved, you're not supposed to marry an unbeliever. That's not what he's getting ready to talk about. He's talking about people that were already married, then one of them got saved. And unlike Ezra, he's trying to tell them you don't have to put them away because they're heathens, like Ezra did. He's saying, no, 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 no. Now that you're saved, you don't have to use that Old Testament to put these people away for no reason that aren't saved. Your spouse isn't saved. This is what he's getting ready to address. So, so God has given him this commandment to us on this side of the cross not to put away an unmarried spouse under conditions, right? But to the rest be God, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. Now, that seems pretty clear, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. you know, if she's pleased to dwell with him, he's saying she's not, but she's pleased to dwell with him, then he shouldn't just divorce her. For what? She's happy. She doesn't have a problem with him being saved. But now remember this. This doesn't just mean uh, if she doesn't want a divorce. This means if she be pleased to dwell with him. That means pleased to dwell and be in submission to his Christian life and walk. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? The conditions are that this person is pleased to dwell with a Christian husband not to prohibit him from if she's complaining about the whole Christian thing that she's not pleased she's not pleased to dwell with him as the head of the house she's not Do, does that make any sense to you mm -hmm. not just wants to stay married but pleased to live under these new conditions in other words she's not going to buck the Christianity that he's going to want to assert into his home if she's going to buck against that, then she's not pleased. And then he gives the opposite here. Verse 13, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Amen. And it's the same thing. If he's going to be pleased to have a Christian wife, and he's not going to violate her conscience, he's not going to violate her walk, he's not going to demand her to do things against the Scriptures, he's not going to demand her to do things against the Lord, then let them remain. There's no reason why they can't remain unmarried because there's not going to be any conflict with the Christian's walk with God. Because the Christian's walk with God is first and foremost for all of us. Yes, sir. And if the unbelieving spouse will allow you to walk freely with the Lord, then there's no reason why um, dissolve that. There's no reason to dissolve that. And my watch says it's 11. Well, I'll reset the stage there. We'll start at verse number 12 next week, and we'll repeat those things that we just said, uh, verse 12 and 13, and then we'll um, finish this thing up. But it's, it's important that you understand what the, the word depart means, uh, because in verse number 15, if, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. If the unbelieving severs the union, then let him do it. That's contrary to what the, what the brethren teach. All right, let's stand. And honestly, if anybody's got an issue with this, it's important that you get this thing settled. If you think I'm way out, out of line here, 
then I'm approachable. Show me in the Bible where, where I'm out of line or I'm misapplying scripture here. We're open to that. Uh, completely open to that. Uh, but I, I think I know what I'm talking about here. I think I have the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Because I'm pointing to the scriptures that the Spirit of God has given. Amen. Amen. All right, let's Amen. go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Josh.